As the chair of the North Atlantic Triangle Commission of the Austrian Academy of Sciences, which has as its task and mission the study of the social and cultural exchange between Europe, the USA, and Canada, and as an international fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, I take particular pleasure in the honor of chairing this panel on ideas crossing the Atlantic, multicultural citizenship, minority cultures, and religious diversity as challenges in democratic, in, in, in liberal democracies, in the past and in the present. And I would like to welcome our Canadian colleagues and you all to this panel. There are people, commodities and ideas across the Atlantic and conscious of the fact that we share the same normative concepts in our liberal democracies. These values seem currently to be under attack in so many parts of the world. We're also cognizant of the many challenges in our own societies, the polarization that has become visible on both sides of the Atlantic. And we know of the serious problems that arose on both continents uh, in the and past. When, uh, and we know of the serious problems and when the ideals of liberal democracies, which had their origin in this part of the world during the Enlightenment, and spread across the Atlantic were only imperfectly realized or even completely betrayed. Considering the past and the attempts to consolidate the core of what may be described as fundamental to liberal democracy, we have in this panel the eminent Austrian historian Gerald Sturz. At the beginning of his career, more than 60 years ago, he studied the pertinent thoughts and actions of the founding fathers of the United States. And in the course of his work in the profession, he has studied the jurisdiction concerning the equal rights of ethnic and national groups in the dual monarchy. In a number of key studies, he has focused on the protection of civil rights as an aspect of what he has labeled isonomy. He will speak on constitutional jurisdiction on both sides of the Atlantic. Professor Gerhard Sturz, kindly begin your presentation. Dear colleagues, uh, constitutional jurisdiction has become a powerful and important element of what we usually, in a rather loose way, call liberal democracy. It first developed beginning in the early 19th century in the United States. Much later, with the early beginnings in Austria, 1867, and more progress after the end of World War I, and a much fuller development after World War II, it developed in Europe and the rest of the world. Canada joined the states with constitutional jurisdiction in 1982. As part of the patriation, I think a Canadian neologism, of the Canadian constitution, that is, the capping of Canadian dependence on the sovereign power of the British Parliament, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms was constructed as part one of the new constitution. In a recent definition, the brilliant Canadian jurist Jacob Weinrib of Queen's University has mentioned a basic condition of the constitutional state. The existence, I quote, of a politically independent judicial body to which any individual can bring a constitutional complaint challenging the validity of any exercise of public authority on the grounds that it violates constitutional right." End of quote. First, I shall deal with the origins of constitutional jurisdiction in the United States. Second, I will give an account of the origins of constitutional jurisdiction in Europe. Third, I shall briefly deal with the Canadian Charter of 1982. Now, first, everyone knows about the case of Marbury versus Madison of 1803 as the beginning of judicial review in the United States. Much less is known about precedents in the individual states before the creation of the federal constitution. The most significant precedent is the little known North Carolina case of Bayard versus Singleton of 1786 to 87. 
A lawyer involved in the case was the British-born James Iredell, later appointed by President Washington to be a justice of the first federal Supreme Court. Iredell argued in favor of the duty of the judges to pronounce judgment as to whether a legislative act had violated the Constitution or not. I quote him. It will not be denied that the Constitution is a law of the state as well as an act of assembly, with the difference only that it is the fundamental law and unalterable by the legislature. Iredell argued further, and I quote again, an act of assembly inconsistent with the Constitution is void and cannot be obeyed without disobeying the superior law to which we were previously and irrevocably bound. Now, uh, this is one of the most forceful justifications of the judicial review of legislation. No constitutional expert of the 21st century could present constitutional jurisdiction better than this lawyer of the late 18th century. To my second point, Europe. Things in Europe developed quite differently. We have to go back to the revolutions of 1848 to 49. The German draft constitution of 1849 contained a paragraph according to which complaints of German citizens regarding violations of, violations of rights granted them by the empire's constitution had to be decided by the empire's court, Reichsgericht. A slightly different formulation got into the Austrian draft constitution of 1849, yet both draft constitutions were never put into practice. For reasons which to enumerate here would go too far, Austria did get a new constitution in 1867. There it was provided that a newly created Reichsgericht, a court of public law separate from the Supreme Court, was empowered to hear appeals of citizens, quote, regarding violations of political rights guaranteed to them by the Constitution. So here we have the first constitutional complaint to go directly to a Supreme Court anyway envisaged. The court did have the power of declaring certain acts of public administration as unconstitutional, but it did not get the complementary power of pronouncing of pronouncing the unconstitutional acts as no longer guilty as void. In spite of this, the constitutional complaint played a great role in Imperial Austria from 1867 to 1918. One constitutional right was the equality of the ethnic groups of the country. The consequence was a great number of constitutional complaints concerning the equal rights of ethnic groups, about which I have written a book, unfortunately not available in English. The additional power to declare unconstitutional provides provisions as void was granted only after the end of the Habsburg monarchy in early 1919 to a newly established court called Constitutional Court. Thus, Austria has become the first country in the world to have a constitutional court. Also in 1919, a little later, the Czechoslovak Republic created a constitutional court, the only two constitutional courts during the interwar period. The real triumph of constitutional jurisdiction came after the end of World War II, with constitutional courts being created in Italy and Germany and subsequently in many other European countries. And after 1989, particularly in the ex-Soviet countries and in many parts of the world. In most of these countries, the constitutional complaint plays a very great role. In Germany, more than 95% of cases reaching the court are constitutional complaints of individuals. Now my third part and last part. The patriation of the Constitution to Canada in 1982 and the construction of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms as part one of the Constitution 
at the time of Pierre Trudeau's second premiership is certainly a major, perhaps the most important constitutional change in the Atlantic world in the 20th century. Superficially, one might say that Canada has gone over from the British system of government, a law of the British Parliament is a supreme law, to the American way of government, two levels of law, ordinary laws and laws of the Constitution. But there are important differences too. The Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms is much more detailed in the enumeration of rights than the US Constitution. There is one well-known flaw in the Canadian Charter, Section 33. It is a result of the so-called Kitchen Accord, a last-minute political deal due to pressure of various provinces on the central government. It empowers the parliaments of the provinces or of the central government to put out of force the constitutional guarantees of certain rights in Section 2 and Section 7 to 15 of the Charter for the duration of five years with the possibility of prolongation. Among others, fundamental rights like the freedom of expression, of religion or of association may be put out of force. Democrat democratic rights and language rights may not be touched. Section 33 has been invoked by some provinces, but never by the central government. On the other hand, now, the inclusion of provisions for the encouragement of affirmative action, section 6.4 and 15.2 of the Charter, is a welcome innovation and has been upheld by the courts. And finally, the constitutional complaint of individuals whose rights or freedoms under the Charter have been infringed or denied to apply to a court of competent jurisdiction is guaranteed in section 24 of the Constitution. Thus, the Canadian Constitution corresponds to the principle laid down by Professor Weinrich mentioned at the beginning and with which I also conclude that a politically independent judicial body must exist to receive constitutional complaints of individual as, as one of the fundamentals of the constitutional state. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, comprehensive survey of constitutional jurisdiction on both sides of the Atlantic in the 19th and 20th century up to the present and to uh, topical uh, problems that may uh, exist. Um, we will hopefully come back uh, to uh, your thoughts later in our program. Um, now, um, we are conscious of the rapid developments in our global village, where unresolved problems travel immensely quickly from one continent to the other. European observers have been keenly conscious also of the reform legislation enacted some 50 years ago which resulted in a liberal immigration regime in Canada. The inclusion of multiculturalism in the Canadian Constitution, a topic which has been intensely debated in Canada, and we will hear about this also, of course, and the adoption there of concepts such as the politics of recognition, all of which have inspired liberal thinkers in Europe. Many have regarded the concept of multiculturalism as a model for European countries faced with a rapidly increasing number of immigrants and the appearance of new ethnic groups. Among Austrian political scientists, Rainer Baubeck, chair of the Academy Commission on Migration and Integration Research, has in his international career been in close touch with many well-known Canadian colleagues on the intricacies of the concept of multicultural citizenship and the role of minority cultures. He will address this topic and the transfer of this concept to and its reception in Europe. Rainer Baubeck, kindly begin your presentation. Yep. Thank you very much for inviting me to this panel. I'm going to talk about the uh, Canadian idea of multicultural citizenship and how it has traveled across the Atlantic 
and how it has changed in this travel. I could have also called my, uh, my short intervention paraphrase in the title of a book by Will Kimlicker, The Transatlantic Odysseys of Multiculturalism. Canada was the first country worldwide to declare itself officially a multicultural nation. In October 1971, Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau declared multiculturalism to be an official policy of the federal government. Australia was the next state to adopt the concept as a label for government policy in 1973. European states followed with considerable delay with the Netherlands, Sweden, and the UK as the only three countries where multiculturalism was officially embraced to some extent in the 1980s and 1990s. Remarkably, all the European states have more or less abandoned the concept since, even a few of the policies that were introduced under this label have been reversed. In the early 2000s and in the wake of the terrorist attacks of 9-11, several prominent European political leaders among them those of countries like Germany and France, Angela Merkel and Nicolas Sarkozy, that had never adopted official multiculturalism in the first place, declared the idea dead and policies pursuing it as having failed. Only Canada is still proudly proclaiming itself to be a multicultural nation with, with official multicultural policies. Even in Canada, however, the concept was always contested. In Quebec, it was often criticized as a ploy by the Trudeau government to diminish the status of French as the second official language and the claims of Quebec to be a distinct society and one of the two founding nations of modern Canada. Multiculturalism was generally wrongly perceived as an attempt to erase the differences between the distinct claims of Francophones, indigenous peoples and immigrant groups. Quebecois policymakers have promoted the term interculturalism as an alternative to multiculturalism, claiming that their approach to diversity resulting from immigration is more integrative, but also highlighting the special status of the dominant Francophone culture that is open for intercultural dialogue with minorities in its territory. Interculturalism as an alternative to multiculturalism has interestingly also resonated in Catalonia, and for the same reasons that Quebecois liberal nationalists found it attractive. Authors defending multiculturalism, such as Tariq Modoud in Britain or Will Kimlicker in Canada, have mostly denied that there is any substantive difference between multicultural and intercultural policies. A second critique of multiculturalism was again first articulated in Canada. Conservative critics resented the symbolic downgrading of national majority cultures whose dominance in the public sphere had previously been taken for granted. Others suggested that multicultural policies would lead to a splintering of the country into segregated parallel societies. Left-wing critics, so left-wing critics focused more specifically on the privileging of ethnocultural and religious differences and regarded multicultural policies of recognition as distracting from the social policies of redistribution targeting inequalities of class, race and gender. Multiculturalism was also blamed for declining solidarity in democratic welfare states. And I think Isabella Becker is going to address this critique in her contribution. All of these charges have resonated strongly in Europe, where they have uh, put advocates of multiculturalism on the defensive. Canada has, however, not only pioneered multicultural policies and their contestation in public debates, it has also produced the most significant body of normative political theories of multiculturalism. After pioneering work by the US-American Iris Marion Young, the most prominent early theoretical works came from Canadians, especially Charles Taylor and Will Kimlicker. I would mention here also another Canadian, Alan Patton, whose more recent book of uh, 2014 on equal recognition provides another comprehensive defense of multiculturalism with the methods of analytical philosophy. Apart from the British scholars Biku Parekh and Tarek Modut, whom I already mentioned, 
no others have been as influential as these Canadian theorists. And many more Canadian names could be added to the list. Even admirers of these works outside Canada have often suggested that they reflect a peculiar Canadian context. First, the intersection of three types of diversity. Two totally concentrated major language groups, a large number of semi-autonomous indigenous peoples, and a huge variety of ethnic groups of immigrant origin. Second, Canada's openness to immigration. It's probably the only Western democracy where majorities have consistently favored more immigration rather than less. And third, the less prominent role of slavery and racism in its history compared to its larger southern neighbor. Especially Will Kimlicker's theory has often been dismissed as being not applicable outside the Canadian context. Kimlicker himself, however, has responded to this charge through a whole series of edited volumes in which he considers contextual con conditions for multiculturalism in other world regions, including Eastern Europe, Asia, Latin America, and Africa. And an important monograph uh, that explores the diffusion of multicultural minority rights in international law and organizations and the limits of universal human rights as a basis for their defense. As an aside, an example for the reverse flow of ideas across the Atlantic, I want to mention that Canadian scholars have also been receptive to political theories about cultural diversity that originated in the late Habsburg monarchy, especially the work of Austro-Marxists Karl Renner and Otto Bauer on national cultural autonomy as a political response to nationality conflicts has resonated with scholars looking for institutional arrangements for dispersed language groups, indigenous or immigrant ones, or those who want to re rehabilitate the ethno-cultural nationalism in a tamed form that denies its territorial claims. Let me conclude with a brief reflection on a more recent development. Whereas in the early 2000s, multiculturalism was proclaimed dead, more recently, it has been revived in a rather unexpected way by right-wing populist governments and intellectuals. Already in the 1980s, French thinkers of the extreme right like Alain Benoit proclaimed a droit à la différence on behalf of national majorities that feel threatened by immigration and ethnic or racial mixing. These ideas have been revamped more recently into the shape of cultural majority rights, whose most intelligent advocates probe Canadian political theories of minority rights by applying their principles to cultural majority claims. As Ellen Patton observed, observes in a recent paper on populist multiculturalism published last year, the original idea seems to have been turned upside down, stated in the 1990s as a theory and policy of cultural minority rights, its language of cultural victimhood, oppression, and alienation, and corresponding claims for cultural self-determination, recognition, and protection are now being hijacked by politicians and intellectuals claiming to speak on behalf of national majorities. Scholars interested in normative justifications of cultural minority rights should not merely reject these misappropriations of their ideas, but also self-critically revisit theories of multiculturalism by asking whether some of their foundations may have made them open to such abuse. And if I may, I will conclude with my own view on this question. It is that it is not the defense of special rights of minorities or the emphasis on the positive value of diversity in liberal democracies that should be reconsidered but the culturalist justifications for the pursuit of such values. I suggest that the culturally neutral values of individual liberty, equal citizenship, and collective self-government suffice to justify cultural freedom rights for everybody, special cultural claim rights for disadvantaged minorities, and powers as well as duties of territorial governments to establish a pluralistic culture that includes all citizens. This argument retains the positive emphasis on the multi in multiculturalism, 
while casting some doubts on the culturalism part of the concept. Such an approach should make it easier to defend multicultural policies in liberal democracies, and it could also help to avoid getting drawn into unproductive cultural wars over identity claims raised on behalf of either minorities or majorities. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much for your analysis and uh, for illustrating the strange way in which the give and take of ideas across the Atlantic uh, may materialize, as it were, in ideas, some of, some of them suspect, as you uh, pointed out. Um, our next speaker is Isabella Backer, a Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, as is Gary Libin, of course, a distinguished research professor in the Department of Politics at York University and a leading global expert in her field. She will analyze, as has been indicated, the way in which the concepts of multiculturalism and multicultural citizenship as policy and ideology function in Canadian society and help restrain opposition to immigration in Canada. In her research, she examines the interplay between feminist perspectives and international public policy with a focus on how macroeconomics and fiscal policy affect questions of gender equity and social justice. She will also touch upon issues which remain unresolved by this publicly accepted mode of cultural practice in Canada. Please, Isabel Becker, begin your presentation. Thank you. And thank you to the Austrian Academy of Sciences and to all my colleagues on this panel. I would like uh, to begin, if I may, on a personal note. I'm particularly delighted and honored to participate in this joint Academy Day, as I consider myself both a citizen of Canada and Austria, which is the land of my birth. So this is kind of a homecoming for me. I want to take my few minutes to suggest that Canadian multiculturalism has dual tensions built into it as both policy and ideology. On the one hand, multiculturalism can be seen as obscuring historical injustices and structural inequalities, some of which have intensified through this pandemic. On the other hand, multiculturalism can be seen as a positive kind of cultural glue binding ethnic diversity and continued support for redistribution through various state programs. In the spirit of transatlantic dialogue, I would like to offer four brief points of critical intervention that highlight the specificities of Canada's multiculturalism and suggest some of the limits of its portability across the Atlantic. Multiculturalism, a policy and ideology, as has been noted, that was developed in stages since 1971, has managed to inscribe the immediate reality of a multi-ethnic society into mainstream Canadian public discourse and Canadian consciousness. Initially compelled by Quebec's struggle for independence, the policy aimed to accommodate all citizens and helped underscore that we were not the great US melting pot, but a society of cultural pluralism. The first point I wish to make is that Trudeau's policy of multiculturalism with a bilingual framework represents in fact a clear division between public and private sectors, wherein multicultural subjects are required or exposed to the norm of two official languages in public whilst retaining their own cultural practices in private, thereby refuting various cultural practices as collective public rights. Second, multiculturalism has not addressed our legacy of settler colonialism. As David MacDonald has pointed out, multiculturalism sits uneasily with many Indigenous people, in part because multiculturalism as promoted from 1971, wasn't designed to recognize Indigenous distinctiveness. Multiculturalism fails to recognize the inherent rights of Indigenous peoples to collective property, which existed before settler colonialism. 
and remains, as Patrick Wolfe reminds us, not a past event, but an ongoing structure. Multiculturalism aligns these original rights and resources alongside a politics of recognition that is equated with ethnic communities and cultural pluralism. This contrasts with Indigenous demands for the recognition of treaty rights, reparations for genocidal cultural practices such as residential schools, and self-government. Third, if we go beyond cultural retention and turn to the second object of multiculturalism, that is social equality, we might ask at this moment in history, how are immigrants integrated into Canada's labour market compared to the dominant Eurocentric groups? COVID-19 has certainly intensified the trend of precarious employment and research shows that during economic crises, those most marginalized and excluded, that is women, immigrants, people with disabilities, racialized people, they suffer the most and are exploited the most. Despite lockdowns, essential workers in healthcare, transportation, online shopping suppliers, these workers do not have a stay at home option. Many go to work sick as they have little or no paid sick leave. Most are from visible minority and often multi-generational immigrant households. This illustrates further that multiculturalism translates issues of racism and structural inequality into cultural diversity. While some contend that multiculturalism as a policy was never meant to address structural inequalities, one can nevertheless argue, as does Himani Manerji, that it serves to diminish or invisibilize such inequalities based on notions of diversity. Finally, as, uh, as was alluded to, I want to comment on the diversity redistribution tension that underpins the multiculturalism promise. Keith Banting has called this tension the progressive's dilemma, a potential trade-off between support for multiculturalism and support for redistribution. For instance, citing the case of the Netherlands, he argues there may be fear that immigration and ethnic diversity are eroding social solidarity and fragmenting the historic coalitions that built the welfare state, leading to the majority population withdrawing political support for resources for newcomers. Contrary to much of the Western world, especially Europe, there has not been a widespread backlash against immigration in Canada, although it must be said that the, that the pandemic has led to calls to maintain current low levels of immigration until we are through the health crisis. Annual immigration in Canada amounts to over 300,000 uh, new immigrants, and this is one of the highest rates per population of any country in the world. So unlike most Western societies, the trade-off feared by progressives between multiculturalism and redistribution hasn't happened. Well, why? Banting suggests that the public policies of what he calls the incorporation regime, designed to incorporate newcomers, that is, on the one hand, immigration policy, which has minimized the dependence of newcomers on social support, integration policy, which represented a state-led transition to a multicultural conception of the country, building on identity, and finally, universal social programs, which reduce the exposure of immigrants to the politics of welfare chauvinism. All of these components of the incorporation regime helped keep the progressive's dilemma at bay. Well, those observations were written well before the current global economic and health crisis. The extent to which this policy regime will hold will depend greatly on the kind of policy framework developed in the post-pandemic period. If austerity rather than fiscal expansionism is the response to government debt, we know from the post-2008 reaction that welfare states and other mechanisms of progressive redistribution are targeted and social tensions may mount, thereby reconfiguring the incorporation regime and creating a politics of recognition that is symbolic 
without financing social inclusion. Yet the cultural glue of multiculturalism is a strong one and has become a part of the mainstream Canadian discourse of national identity, thus forestalling broad antagonism to immigration. From the fiscal perspective, finally, of the welfare state and the incorporation regime, broader questions should be raised about how to finance the politics of inclusion, recognition, and substantive equality. As the Austrian fiscal theorist Rudolf Goldscheidt remarked in his 1925 essay, A Sociological Approach to Problems of Public Finance, democratizing public finance that is developing democratically owned forms of public wealth creation versus relying on the state's dependence on taxes would create the potential, the potential for a post pandemic moment of progressive policies that would uphold the redistribution bargain. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your analysis of the challenges faced by the liberal democracy in Canada and uh, potential um, idea and ideas that may potentially, again, in the give and take across the Atlantic, um, uh, provide solutions for uh, the Canadian uh, context. As you have mentioned, and as we all are aware of, Canada has seen the arrival of hundreds of thousands, even millions of migrants from other continents over the last 50 years. And numerous visible minorities are firmly established in Canada. This fact, which is manifest especially in Toronto with its very high percentage of immigrants speaking their own languages, has resulted in cultural change. Professor Gary Libben, a prominent psycholinguist teaching in the Department of Applied Linguistics at Brock University, and the director of the Humanities Division of the Royal Society of Canada has developed and led research initiatives that seek to understand how words are represented and processed in the mind and the brain. He is also a corresponding member of the Austrian Academy of Sciences and has insights to offer on the immensely complex consequences of the bilingualism of immigrants as agents of cultural change also in Central Europe. Professor Gary Libben, please. Thank you so much for, for the very kind introduction. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to, to be here and to be part of uh, this discussion. Um, I, I'd like to add uh, to the discussion um, a tool that you may, be, may find useful, perhaps if not considered. So let me begin in the following way. In the, in the dramatic, dramatic developments of these past months, the expression words matter has found itself in the center of political and cultural discourse. I am a psycholinguist, so naturally I am inclined to read a great deal into expressions such as words matter. Today I'd like to discuss with you how they can be used to track and understand the cognitive dimension of multiculturalism in Austria, in Canada, and elsewhere. I hope, I'm, I'm hoping that it will be a tool that you will find useful in your own thinking and perhaps in your own research. I believe that uh, its usefulness follows from three observations that I'll very briefly discuss today. Um, one is that both Austria and Canada are countries of immigration. Uh, two, bilingualism has subtle cognitive effects that create cultural consequences, and three, that there are new and developing research tools that allow us to examine the psycholinguistics of cultural development. Let me go to the first. Austria and Canada are countries of immigration. 50 years ago, the population of Canada was 21 million. It's now almost 38 million. Yet in all but four of those 50 years, the birth rate in the country has declined. Of course, the simple fact is that Canada's population growth has been driven by immigration. Both Austria and Canada are countries that are highly sought destinations for immigration. Surely a factor in this is that Vienna has consistently been at the top of the Economist Intelligence Unit's Global Livability uh, Index, as 
the, the, the best city to live in in the world. According to its uh, statistical report, the average share of Vienna's foreign, uh, born population was 41% in 2020. 35% of Austria's new immigrants moved to Vienna. According to Statistics Canada in 2016, 51% of Toronto's population was born outside Canada. One would expect that it's uh, a fair bit higher now. The second point I'd like to bring up is that bilingualism has uh, subtle cognitive effects that create cultural consequences. These, uh, the 51% um, uh, of, of people in Toronto born outside of Canada are are very likely to speak more than one language. Uh, as I mentioned uh, uh, at the outset, I'm a psycholinguist. Uh, psycholinguists study the mental representations and processes that accompany language activity. The field is essentially the study of how people do language. Recent work on psych the psycholinguistics of lexical processing has shown that mental representations can be probed through research that is experimental in nature but which can be mobilized to understand cultural change. And this is particularly true when bilingualism is involved. So from a psycholinguistic perspective, the dominant characteristic of immigrants is that they're bilingual and multicultural. And in Canada, immigrants are much more likely than non-immigrants to speak more than one language, 76% compared to 27%. So immigrants, bring bilingualism with them, and then they grow and change in their new environment. And it's that that can make them important agents for cultural change, perhaps even cultural transcendence. The reason for this lies in the psycholinguistics of bilingualism. Although it might seem at first blush that the hallmark of effective bilingualism is the ability to, to keep two languages separate, at a deeper cognitive level, it's really quite the opposite. The languages of a bilingual person, whether that person is speaking or hearing, writing or reading, are always active. In this way, it can be said that although a person may speak many languages, each with their own vocabulary store, at a deeper cognitive level, the person is always speaking one language. Um, and using one single cognitive vocabulary or mental lexicon. This has immediate consequences for how bilingualism and immigration can be drivers of cultural change. Every new word that you would acquire in a new language changes your vocabulary system as a whole. The reason for this is that in your mental lexicon, everything is connected with everything else. And the consequences of this are related to just the size of the system. New immigrants to Austria and to Canada, even if they already speak an official language of the country upon arrival, will need to learn a great, uh, a great many new, uh, new words, as I just did uh, but a few minutes ago. The word invisibilize was not in my vocabulary uh, in, until about 15 minutes ago. Uh, as a result of that learning, um, People change who they are. Uh, they see the world in, in new ways. They understand it in new ways. In, indeed, they're engaged in culture creation. And to get a sense of the scale, it's been estimated that an, an, an average native speaker of English will know about 42,000 words by the age of 20. That's an underestimate, but let's stay with a safe underestimate. Um, this means that uh, it, it's possible that the number of within lexicon connections for that person at age 20 will be about 882 million. That's a very large number of connections. And we've not yet considered the indisputable fact that uh, somebody, anybody, certainly an immigrant, uh, who learns new words in adulthood adds significantly to his or her vocabulary store. And to get a sense of what would happen there, the consequence of adding a mere 100 words of a second language to a 42,000 word vocabulary would result in about 4.2 million new connections. In this way, adding a new word 
uh, is not just adding something, it's changing who you are because it forces a restructuring of the system as a whole. So uh, immigrants new, learn new words, they learn lots of new words. Uh, they often do so later in life. This changes them and it creates the opportunity for cultural transcendence. And now finally, to the topic of new research opportunities. Until recently, there was very little work that directly linked the psycholinguistics of lexical processing to cultural aspects of bilingualism, uh, such as those I've just alluded, alluded to. In recent years, however, there have been many uh, exciting new developments. One of them has to do with uh, the use of very large corpora that certainly increased as a result of COVID-19 research. Uh, the analysis of these very large corpora of language, speech, and writing create unprecedented opportunities to connect language processing to the social, cultural, and political context in which it occurs. This is a new development that I consider to be potentially transformational. Another branch of developing research that I consider to have potential uh, substantial psycholinguistic and cultural consequences involves a study of written production itself. Um, a very recent study I've uh, conducted with uh, Professor Wolfgang Tresla, who is also a member of the Austrian Academy of Sciences, has used millisecond by millisecond analyses of typing patterns to probe cognitive activities and states that co-occur when people are writing text. In my view, this technique offers us a way to measure, potentially in, in longitudinal studies, how the language production of individuals, for example, immigrants, non-immigrants, scholars, even creative writers, can provide us with information on their affective and cognitive states while they are doing language. And I see this as a tremendously exciting opportunity. So now, in summary, here's what I've highlighted. Both Austria and Canada are certainly countries of immigration. Bilingual immigrants can be agents of cultural change. And through the analysis of psycholinguistics and bilingualism, we can track how they are agents of cultural change and measure the linguistic and, correlates, uh, and cognitive correlates of that change. I think it's important to note that the situation that I've described is certainly not unique to Austria or Canada. But there may be a way in which together we have a unique opportunity to better understand it and to gain insight into the microstructure of cultural transcendence. It's um, I hope that I've also offered you a tool that you might find useful in that endeavor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the analysis of uh, very complex uh, phenomena that are linked to the global phenomenon of the movement of people and the arrival of migrants and uh, the um, increase in the complexity of the language situation in societies where there are speakers of, uh, who are bilingual and perhaps trilingual, et cetera, et cetera, and the resources that this may provide for the student, for the scholar, uh, trying to understand the complexity of these phenomena and use them also perhaps uh, in uh, ways favorable to the social situation in countries. Now, European students of Anglophone and Francophone literature written in Canada have been struck by the literary vitality of writers from these groups and have noted the recognition they have received through major awards in Canada. Scholars have also been aware of the liberal support that authors of allophone backgrounds who write in heritage languages have found in Canada over the last 30 or 40 years. As an expert in Anglophone Canadian literature, Maria Löschnik from the University of Graz has explored many texts originating from such backgrounds, including migration narratives. She will speak about the reflection of cultural diversity in them as she has analyzed the struggle of individuals to achieve and to enjoy the full benefits of citizenship and the way in which their experiences are rendered tangible and communicable in a variety of texts by creative writers in Canada. These texts have considerable appeal to European, also to Austrian students 
as the popularity of such topics for masters and doctoral theses show. European students may, we may reflect, thus gain understanding and develop some empathy with individuals from very different cultural backgrounds while observing the inevitable, often existential challenges they face in their move to other countries, including the countries of Central Europe. Such insights may result in resistance to those populist trends that immediately denounce shifts in the demographic composition of urban communities, and we've just heard about that in Toronto and indirectly also in Vienna, in Europe, and the alleged growth of ethnic neighborhoods in them. Maria Leschnik, kindly present your ideas on the topic uh, of our panel. Well, thank you very much for your kind introduction and thank you for inviting me to this panel. Um, words matter, Gary Libbins has said, and uh, I couldn't agree more since this is also at the core of literary representations uh, of migration and multiculturalism. And I particularly like this, this idea that one new word sort of creates a whole new system of interconnections which is also at the core of uh, the notion of literature as cultural ecology, for example, which claims that each new work of literature, not just is a new work of literature, but it also changed the whole interrelation of uh, aesthetic connections. Um, in my brief um, contribution here, I would like to offer some glimpses as to how literature can do different things than factual, documentary and pragmatic discourses with regard to understanding migration experiences and the complex genesis of multicultural societies. It is in literature as a form of cultural practice that the human factor of migration expresses itself. This is possible due to literature's specific aesthetic and imaginative quality. <clears throat> in other words, writers make use of literature's license to say anything in every possible way in order to make experiences of migration communicable and understandable. They may use fictionalizing the fictionalizing of experience in order to deal with the affective dimension of migration. Thus, they make use, for example, of internal and multiple perspectives and of potent images and narrative configurations in order to address issue, issues such as multiple and transcultural identities, generational conflicts, the issue of living in two or more language systems, problems of acculturation, racism and cultural stereotyping, and the liminal cultural space between here and there, between then and now, which may either be productive or suffocating. In my talk, I shall illustrate this aesthetically grounded potential of literature with the help of three examples. First, the rhetoric of evocative metaphoric configuration. Second, the letter as an example of meaning-making significance of narrative voice. And third, the short story cycle as an example of how genre as such can be a form of meaning. Since one of my research interests has been the Canadian short story, I shall discuss how Canadian authors have compellingly used this genre for depicting lives impacted by experience, experience of migration and otherness. In fact, as Adrian Hunter, among others, has argued, due to its elliptic, fragmentary, fleeting, suggestive and ambiguous nature, the short story appears particularly well suited to the mediation of crisis and of forms of destabilization. Let me come to my first point. <clears throat> Since the short story shows a tendency towards concentration that does not allow for much of the arbitrary, it invites the multi-layered arrangement of imagery. This condensed pattern of metaphoric signification has been employed by Canadian authors in order to translate precarious emotional states into concrete images, images which make the experience of cultural, dis cultural dislocation or of a liminal, liminal state between two or more cultural frameworks understandable for the reader. In particular, forms of chronic and quotidian suffering which often accompany experiences of displacement and which are marginalized in public discourses due to 
due to their lack of, of a tangible, tangible impact, are given voice in short fiction, where the abstract is distilled into a single effect through a strong concentration of suggestive images. The writer who may serve as an example here is Italian-Canadian author Katarina Edwards. In Island of the Nightingales, published in 2000, she offers six densely knit snapshots that address a broad spectrum of what it means to be Italian-Canadian and which foreground gender as a decisive factor in, Italian, in the Italian diaspora. Let me briefly illustrate this on the examples of two stories, namely Primavera and On a Plata. In Primavera, fantasies of speed and running on the part of the female protagonist, an Italian immigrant in Canada, are consistently juxtaposed to her paralyzed state concretized in her pregnancy. These fantasies denote her wish to escape from a world she experiences as cold, as hostile and stifling. Space and climatic conditions are strongly semanticized in the story, emphasizing the sterility and coldness of Canada as opposed to Maria's nostalgic remembrance of Primavera, the Italian spring. Her crisis reaches a climax as she is about to give birth to her child, with her while her pregnancy and its discomfort signified her home sickness in a literal sense, the act of giving birth becomes a compelling image of her painful but eventually successful acculturation of getting grounded in Canada. That immigration affects women differently from men is even more explicitly, more explicitly suggested in On a Platter, where immigration is rendered as an act of liberation from, suffer from the suffocating moral codes and family ties still to be found in traditional rural communities in Italy. Thus, Fulvia, the protagonist, left Sicily as a young woman to settle in Edmonton, Alberta, in order to escape the patriarchal community of Catania. However, as the story implies, the act of repressing her heritage eventually materializes in breast cancer. Fulvia, in the end, realizes that she is not inviolable and that the past will keep haunting her unless she accepts it. The two stories demonstrate how configurations of images may evoke the psychological complexities of the immigrant experience. In addition to the symbolic implications of pregnancy and disease mentioned above, Edwards mentioned before, Edwards, like a number of diasporic authors, also uses the trope of food in order to translate abstract concepts into concrete and relatable scenarios. Regarding my second point, narrative voice, I want to briefly comment on the multifunctional use of epistolary elements in fictions addressing migration and cultural ethnic otherness. In these narratives, the letter becomes a materialized space to denote both distance and connection and to reflect the push and pull factors that migrant experiences may involve. Rabindranath Maharaj's the, Di the Diary of a Down Courage Domestic and Austin Clark's Waiting for the Postman to Knock and Four Stations in His Circle may serve as examples here. In Maharaj's story, the letters between Irma, who has come to Canada as a domestic, and her husband Paul, who has stayed in Trinidad, fulfill various functions. They denote the gap between Trinidad and Canada, which they also bridge, they represent the, lim the liminal space between here and there. Even though Irma has physically arrived in the new place, she has mentally remained, as the letters suggest, um, in between two different cultural frameworks. Moreover, the letters create polyvocality. Writing also acquires a therapeutic function for Irma when she communicates the humiliating ordeals she has to undergo in order to find employment. Her ironic depiction of the frequently materialistic, materialistic and patronizing attitudes of Canadians bears ample critical potential. Like Irma, Enid, the main character in Austin Clark's Waiting for the Postman to Knock, is also a Caribbean domestic in Canada. However, while in Mahari's story, the letters create an intimate space for a couple to bridge their physical distance, Clark uses the epistolary form to render the plight of an, indi of an individual faced with bureaucratic um, anonymity 
as Eni tries to explain her dire situation to a real estate company. The letter form adopts yet another function in Clark's four stations in his circle. Here a letter from the main character's mother, which is burned and never answered, stands for the pull of the culture of origin and is symptomatic of the protagonist's obsession with erasing his, Canadian, uh, his Caribbean heritage in order to pass as a proper Canadian. As we learn, this obsession results not least from racism he has experienced in Toronto. Let me now conclude with my third point. When Elizabeth Salo Hayes claims that the short story in Canada can be seen as an ethnic genre, this holds true even more strongly for the short story cycle. In contrast to the novel, the short story cycle allows for new unity in disunity and reflects a fragmented temporal sense as Gerald Lynch argues. When it comes to life stories, the breaking up of, a novelist, of, of novelistic trajectories in favor of refracted episodic structures seems particularly suitable to the rendering of lives disrupted by migration. A number of Canadian authors have encoded narratives of migration and cultural displacement in such sequential modes of short fiction. They have thereby demonstrated that genre is not just an instrument for the transmission of meaning, but cons constitutes a system of meaning in itself. Examples are, among others, um, David Bitsmotsky's um, Natasha, or Makeda Silvera's Remembering G, or Alice Munro's The View from Castle Rock. Um, in these works of autobiographical fiction, the episodic storification mirrors the fragmentation of my migrant lives. Like the inclusion of letters, the short story cycle too lends itself to polyvocal and multiply perspectivized narration, thus combining different experiences and establishing meaningful relations between them. Examples of this type would be Rohinton Mysteries' Tales from Thiro Shabbat, for example, or Terry Vatara's The Ruma Days, or Rahna Mara's of Custom, Customs in Excise. Through these glimpses at literary representations of migration and multiculturalism, I've tried to show how authors draw from the rich inventory of aesthetic expression in order to render the emotional aspects of migration, as well as the complexities of multicultural interaction within national frameworks. Due to the limited time, only three aesthetic strategies could be briefly introduced. It goes without saying, however, that these represent only a segment within the very wide spectrum of creative literary expression. Since this panel is concerned with ideas crossing the Atlantic, let me conclude by emphasizing how avidly ideas have, um, have been taken up by students in Austria. Using my own experience as an example, 35 out of the 78 diploma theses and 6 out of 10 dissertations I have mentored so far deal with Canadian literature and culture, thus testifying to the vibrant exchange of ideas between Canada and Austria. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your focus on the mediation uh, and uh, in an intimate way of the challenges for newcomers. Um, visible minorities, etc., in the democratic, uh, in the democratic and liberal democracy of Canada. Now, the example of Canadian efforts to cope with this complex problem as a liberal democracy may offer a stimulus to reflect on oversights and problematic aspects of regulations concerning refugees, asylum seekers on this side of the Atlantic. But for the literary and cultural scholar studying the give and take across the Atlantic, which has been amply uh, illustrated in the face of various challenges in democracies, there may be still another way in which continental Europe uh, may self-contribute a suitable method and a useful approach in the field of scholarship, namely through what has, been come to, was, what has come to be called imagology. This subdiscipline of comparative literature and cultural studies was, despite some resistance, developed by academics such as Hugo Dieserink at Aachen in Germany after World War II, especially after the mid-1960s, and expanded and applied further by his sometime disciple Jörg Leersen, now based in Amsterdam, of course, and his associates. <clears throat> 
It was also contributed to by other scholars such as the Austrian anglicist F.K. Stanzel long before Benedict Anderson's widely recognized imagined communities of 1983 attracted attention. Drawing on the insights of socio-psychology and showing the opposition between in-groups and out-groups, the overt or covered, covered use of auto-stereotypes and heterostereotypes in both non-fiction and literary texts, these continental European scholars have revealed and described the generation and dissemination of dubious notions of the typical character of nations and ethnic groups in and through literature from the Renaissance to the present day. And they are still disseminated through the media, including film. By alerting readers to these processes through which questionable generalizations complicate relations between ethnic and national groups, the imagologists help to locate sources of conflicts which impede the recognition and acceptance of the civil rights of groups and of individuals. Without restricting or censuring the play of the imagination of writers, which has often been stimulated by such vague notions of typical figures, the subdiscipline of imagology may help to curb the excesses of identity politics. It may give more space to the individual and may thus counteract hostile views of the composition of societies with a number of minorities. That this discipline has still to achieve full currency in North America is apparent in some North American reviews of European monographs or studies on the images of certain countries or nations. So much as uh, my own short uh, comment uh, in the context of our um, panel. And now, of course, uh, what we would like to engage in is a conversation on this very broad topic of our panel and uh, eventually, of course, also uh, individuals uh, will listen in and uh, who would like to offer their comments are welcome to pose questions uh, which will hopefully be answered by uh, this multidisciplinary group of historians, um, political scientists, literary and cultural uh, students, and uh, a psycholinguist. All right, may I uh, invite comments uh, uh, by the members of the panel, and then, uh, of course, also um, uh, invite um, comments from the public that may have tuned in. Okay. Um, may I begin with a question uh, that goes back to the 1990s uh, when uh, in the debate of multiculturalism in the United States, uh, a, a historian like David Hollinger and other cultural historians argued for a post-ethnic society. Has this intervention uh, more than 25 years ago and manifest in publications which were at that time uh, taken up? Has this been completely uh, eliminated? Has this been ended by the events uh, that have been described by the trends and the phenomena uh, that we have seen in migration societies, uh, in liberal democracies like uh, Canada, and uh, perhaps also on this side of the Atlantic. Okay, uh, can I suggest that uh, our political scientists uh, who may be aware of, this, of these uh, studies uh, uh, that are 25 years back uh, may uh, perhaps comment, uh, etc. All right. Okay. 
Yes. Uh, so since, since you ask uh, the political scientists on the panel, I might as well try to come up with an answer. I think David Hollinger's uh, diagnosis or also prognosis of the post-ethnic society was maybe a little bit over-optimistic. Uh, what we've seen since is that uh, a spirit of, let's say, roughly the 1990s, which is really the, the period when multiculturalism takes off intellectually. Not, you know, it was invented, as we discussed before, as a public policy, but uh, uh, it became a big uh, idea uh, that crossed the Atlantic in the, in the 1990s. And then, you know, multiculturalism uh, was accused in the 2000s of being not post-ethnic, but segmenting society into distinct cultural, religious, and ethnic groups. That was the European perspective, much more than the original intent of the, the policy, at least in Canada, as I see, which I think there was always some discussion between the Canadians and David Hollinger. I remember that very well where he said there is this danger in Canadian multiculturalism that it will lead to a segmentation of ethnic groups, a pluralism of difference rather than uh, uh, hybridity. But in the 1990s, um, according to my recollection, the spirit that um, there is uh, post-ethnicity and also in, in the field of cultural studies, hybridity, will be the natural outcome of a multicultural dynamic in a diverse society where ever more groups of immigrant origin mingle with the native population that is already so diverse in its composition in the Canadian context. Uh, and uh, I, I have to say that uh, it hasn't quite worked out this way. <laughs> you know, uh, we've seen a, a rather a consolidation uh, of uh, cultural boundaries in various types of public discourses. And that was partly due to, uh, I think, backlashes that uh, are connected to the failure of the progressive left that was originally promoting multiculturalism. So, you know, the, the, it's also, as, as Isabella Becker has already pointed out, I think, uh, connected to other forms in which li liberalism as an economic theory is seen to have failed or to have brought about deeper divisions in society. So the, those uh, deeper forms of social inequality and the perception that this is a big crisis were also linked to the uh, notion that the enthusiasm for cultural diversity might have been uh, overblown uh, to a certain extent, and it might have even uh, contributed to further divisions. But I think the big thing is that the cultural conservatives have discovered that rhetoric and used for themselves. This is what I was trying to allude to when I spoke about this new discourse of cultural majority rights. And here we see a complete reversal of the idea of uh, polyethnicity, uh, post-ethnicity and, and hybridity as the outcome. And I think I'm afraid you see it also to a certain part on, uh, in, in, in the more radical currents uh, on, on, on the left, you know, that play cultural identity politics from the other side and also reject hybridity uh, as a concept because they want people to think and uh, from the perspective of a stance, an epistemological stance that is linked to unalterable forms of identity, of, uh, be it of class, of race, uh, of, of gender. And that I think is, is a loss uh, in the discourse generally, uh, but I don't, I'm not terribly optimistic that it can be overcome in the current context. If I may add, perhaps uh, a, an observation that has um, been resonating in uh, literary studies, uh, the, the uh, claim that individuals who don't belong to an ethnic group uh, uh, should not be allowed to enter into the minds of uh, other characters, uh, as if uh, a, let's say, um, a um, Canadian or a writer with a certain background could not present uh, figures and explore the minds of uh, newcomers to the society. 
a, a kind of censorship almost has been demanded and uh, individuals have been, as it were, prohibited from uh, uh, exploring uh, the um, uh, perceptions and the feelings of individuals outside uh, uh, different from the writer, be it male or female or whatever. Um, this, of course, is an absolutely in uh, contrast to what in literary studies has been regarded as uh, the sign of genius. Uh, think of Shakespeare, think of William Faulkner, uh, think of Eudora Welty in the field of Southern literature, and uh, writers, of course, also in the Canadian uh, literary tradition who have shown their skill, their uh, intense capability of applying what um, John Keats would term negative capability, of trying to get into the skins and thus have a sense of the problems uh, and experiences and the quality of individuals belonging to a different um, a, 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 a person with a different background, uh, belonging to a different class, belong, belonging uh, to a different uh, ethnic and cultural group, uh, which is, of course, a, a, a considerable risk and danger also for because it would narrow dramatically the range of what is appealing to us as readers of literature. Uh, uh, Maria Leshnik wanted to intervene. Yeah, yeah, actually, I wanted to just connect to what you've said, because in literary studies, uh, the problem that uh, comes more and more to the fore is actually the whole appropriation of voice debate. So actually, it is more and more problematic uh, to, as a writer to really adopt the voice, uh, especially of uh, indigenous characters, but maybe also of uh, different ethnic uh, communities, yeah? So uh, this is a very sensitive and tricky question, I'd say, because on the one hand, uh, I totally agree that, that these, this sort of censorship would really reduce the possibilities of literary or creative expression, would reduce the possibilities of trying to imagine being sort of in another's uh, situation or whatever. On the other hand, it is also problematic yeah, if certain communities have the feeling that uh, you are sort of um, yeah, taking control of, of their stories and of their point of view. So I think that's, it is a discussion we've, we've uh, been very um, vividly discussing in, in a conference, at a conference uh, on, on native Canadian literature actually. Uh, and uh, the positions were quite polarized regarding this issue. And uh, actually, I, I wouldn't know a solution, but it's it's definitely a severe problem. Um, this uh, uh, limitation that is imposed or threatens to be imposed uh, would, of course, weaken uh, the um, uh, acceptability, because one of the appeal uh, and uh, a special appeal of literary studies uh, might help, of course to uh, strengthen empathy, which is, of course, also an element in a social uh, community. Um, and it's also, of course, a question of uh, individual rights uh, and uh, collective rights. But uh, if you invite people to uh, empathize with individuals from other backgrounds that should, as uh, was indicated, uh, remove uh, the um, exclusionary uh, tendencies, the resistance, the unwillingness to be hosts, to accept uh, the arrivals of others, be it in very firmly established relatively homogeneous societies, though there are fewer and fewer, of course, in this global world. 
Um, all right. Um, are there any suggestions, any questions concerning the important legal aspects that um, have been uh, that uh, Gerald Stewart's drew our attention to uh, the um, important uh, steps forward in the 19th century and then in the 20th century and the give and take across the Atlantic, uh, etc. Um, are there any uh, comments? Um, there was one question which I should I read out as a language teacher from from the floor while we are waiting for the members of the uh, panel to perhaps comment. As a language teacher teaching English to quite young learners, I have observed that my multi multilingual students absorb the new language much more easily than my monolingual students and can switch from one language to another with comparative ease. Uh, a positive uh, uh, experience, uh, which perhaps Gary Libben would confirm that uh, to be bilingual uh, may uh, strengthen the capabilities of individuals. Is there or are there some caveats in this respect uh, on the basis of your research? And, uh... Uh, I think I think the research among, uh, among uh, for young people does support uh, that that statement. Uh, all other things being equal, of course, they really are all equal because there are other factors that uh, that uh, that that do play a role. But uh, all other things being equal, there there does seem to be a, a very substantial advantage, both cognitively and, and otherwise, of bilingualism. And of course, that just is intuitively. Uh, uh, I think accessible to many uh, many of us who uh, who upon reflection might might remember that when they first started learning another language the idea that there was such a thing as a language in other words that oh yes this is a system not just the way things always are and always have been that that in itself is something very important to learn um, the uh, uh, of course the bilingual children come uh, through their experience knowing that although they might not be able to articulate it, they certainly do know it all right um uh, yes please kind of probably please uh, well, your... since since you asked us to comment also on professor Sturz's uh, uh reflections on uh, the importance of uh, constitutions and constitutional traditions and the, even the invention of the constitutional court I, as, I wanted to ask him how he would reflect on uh, the importance of different constitutional traditions uh, in the US, in Canada, and in countries like Austria that, uh, from my perspective, I would summarize like this. The US oldest uh, continuous democracy has a constitution that is almost unalterable, and that is treated as a sacred document that can only be interpreted. Uh, in Canada, the constitution is much more a, a process. You know that uh, uh, there, there is the charter and there are the other elements, but the negotiations, uh, especially between uh, you know, the, the claims of uh, dealing with the claims of Quebec and the indigenous, the Mitch Lake Accord and all of this, re remained uh, surprisingly unsettled. And there seems to be some status where people accept that uh, stability can be achieved without uh, finally deciding some of the most crucial constitutional questions that are disputed, such as the notwithstanding clause in the Canadian constitution that remains you know, disputed and in a way its application is unresolved. And then you have the Austrian tradition, you know, that goes back to Kelsen, of course, where the constitution is uh, basically an element of positive law that is supposed to uh, to function continuously, but that can be quite easily changed with a two-thirds parliamentary uh, majority. So, uh, uh, which has raised the, the specter in countries with similar constitutional traditions, such as Hungary, that if uh, a certain uh, a government that is not a broad-based coalition, but uh, based on a very ideological uh, stance, uh, as is the case in Hungary now, 
on one side of the political spectrum, it may overturn the constitution very easily and create a constitution that fits its own purposes. So the idea that the constitution is there in order to provide a kind of glue in uh, hyper diverse societies, uh, it's amazing that you see these very different constitutional traditions and there, I was just going to ask Professor Sturz how he thinks that one model might be better, you know, uh, suited to cope with dynamic changes and diversity than another model. And I've just described the three US, American, Canadian and Austrian in a very ideal, ideal typical way, maybe as a caricature. And of course, Professor Sturz knows them much better than I do. But that's, that would be my take on, uh, on uh, how to link the debate that we've had on uh, diversity and immigration with these uh, uh, pluralism of constitutional traditions. Um, uh, I really do not enough know about the Canadian constitution to, to go into any details which you have referred. Uh, I, I, would, I would make purpose one point. There are considerable differences between rigid constitutions and flexible constitutions. Uh, that seems to be an important difference. Uh, perhaps one of the most rigid constitutions in the world certainly is the United States Constitution. Um, and uh, much of, well, of the, the, the type, the, the way in which politics is discussed has to do with this fact. Uh, amendments, as we all know, Very in difficult. America are extremely difficult, extremely difficult and rare. In Austria, but also in many other, in most other countries, I would say the flexibility is much greater. Uh, changes in the constitution, amendments can be done in Austria very easily, uh, normally. Uh, there are some special cases where a plebiscite of the whole population is necessary, uh, like uh, the decision of Austria to join the, the European Union. But this is very rare. Uh, normal changes of the constitution can be done easily uh, by parliament uh, and are done very often. And also, which is not so, uh, something which is not so much uh, known, uh, constitutional articles are inserted in normal laws. That is to say, uh, the constitution in a formal sense is much broader than the document of the constitution. constitution. Constitutional elements are in laws or in parts of laws and can be changed and have been changed very frequently. Uh, I am uh, personally a, I would say, I the advocate of flexible constitutions. Uh, it, uh, it makes politics easier and in a way it makes it more democratic. Um, the, uh, the difficulties in America also with the composition of the Supreme Court are really very great and uh, this has led within the last 30 to 40 years uh, to a rising amount of scholars, scholarly literature criticizing constitutional jurisdiction and criticizing the increasing power of constitutional courts as compared to parliamentary institutions. I'm, uh, I'm not so pessimistic as some of these critics because I do think that constitutional jurisdiction is part of our system of government, which does not consist only of democracy in the pure sense, but also uh, of, of participation of citizens, but also of the protection of citizens. And for the protection of citizens, uh, constitutional systems of constitutional jurisdictions are important. But for instance, uh, I'm, uh, uh, I, I know that I disagree with the present constitutional court of Austria. Uh, I'm a great favorer of dissenting opinions, uh, which exist in most countries of the world, not in Austria, not in France, not in Italy, not, I think, in Belgium, 
and, uh, and Luxembourg, but in many other European countries, uh, in America, of course, uh, in the English-speaking world, uh, the idea and the possibility of dissenting opinions is an element of democratization. It makes a judicature and jurisprudence more democratic. It adds an additional element to public discussion, uh, democratic discussion. That, I think, is important. I'm, I'm, that's uh, the reason I'm a great favor of, of dissenting, of publicized dissenting opinions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I may just add, uh, as our time is almost up, a question from uh, Wolfgang Kloos in Trier, one of uh, the prominent uh, uh, Canadian studies people. Uh, as to what extent was the implementation of multiculturalism in 1972 motivated by the threat of Quebec separatism? How strongly trans transculturalism describe contemporary social life in Canada? And how would you cope with Saul's idea concept of triangularity? Uh, this to, especially to our political scientists uh, as a, a topic from a, a cultural um, and literary historian, of course, and scholar. Can yeah, we still I, handle I this? A few comments on that very interesting question. I think that, uh, as I tried to suggest in my remarks, that uh, the adoption of uh, multiculturalism as a as a national policy was very much compelled by um, the independent forces that were uh, gaining political momentum in Quebec. Uh, from the mid to the to the late 60s in particular and into the early 1970s. But I think uh, hitched onto that were also demands from uh, the indigenous population for self-government and the increasing number of uh, immigrants coming into Canada from non-European countries, namely India, China, and uh, the Caribbean. So I think that all of those uh, forces came together around the time that the, pro that the, that the policy was actually uh, formulated. And as I tried to suggest in my comments, it, it really has had a very powerful um, policy side. So it created a kind of path dependency, as economists say, where um, it locked together the idea of multiculturalism with um, the federal state and its provisioning functions. And uh, it also had a very strong kind of impact in terms of the way in which Canadian identity, if you can call it that, was formulated and continues to be formulated, even if uh, the reality does not meet necessarily the, the promise of the ideology. Fine, fine. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm afraid that while we would have enough uh, topics to discuss and consider and exchange opinions, uh, the, 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 the pattern and the frame of our uh, panel doesn't allow us to continue now, but we very much hope to continue our discussion and involve academics on both sides of the Atlantic and uh, I hope that this is a beginning uh, of uh, a discussion and a debate uh, to which we will all contribute. Obviously, uh, the publication that the Academy has promised to, pro uh, to produce will also be one element in this uh, uh, ongoing uh, debate. And I should like to thank you uh, for your contributions. Uh, alas, we don't have more time. There are other panels which should be listened to. Uh, they will begin, I believe, in uh, about 12 or 13 minutes. And uh, thank you very much indeed. And keep safe, as uh, our friends uh, who are of Anglophone background suggest. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right.